Sarah. This is episode 54. I am coming to you from northern Maine in the United States in the northern hemisphere. It's a little chilly today, although it is summer, and I have layered on some um, wool. <laughs> I had a cowl on yesterday and a wool sweater and the day before because it has been it's been pretty damp and cold. I've been thoroughly enjoying that though and taking the opportunity to get some work done on some sweaters and some sewing and I want to share that with you. If you are a new viewer, you are most welcome and thank you so much for tuning in. And if you are a returning viewer, you are most welcome and thank you for coming back. As I always say, it's a broken record. Um, I so much appreciate the community that we've created here, all of your comments and emails and reactions and feedback. I read everything. I don't always get a chance to respond, but uh, I do make a point to read everything that comes my way and use that as an opportunity to reflect on my own craft and my own creativity. So thank you so much for keeping that spark going in a little bit of a, of a barren making and crafting land that I live in. Well, it's barren because it's primarily myself and my husband, who I have lured into the fold with mostly knitting. Um, and uh, so I really do look to that uh, outside community to share. And I'll talk a little bit about that in some of my sewing projects. So this is a knitting and spinning podcast, although it may not feel like that today because a lot more of my work has been with sewing, but there is some knitting. Primarily we focus on place-based yarns, which is a term I've started to use to describe micro mill, um, well, as it sounds, yarns that capture a landscape or capture a place. Um, and I think that will be fleshed out. That definition will be fleshed out a little bit for you if you're just joining us um, as we talk about some acquisitions and discoveries. Um, and we also focus on breed-specific yarns and fibers in this podcast. So what do I have lined up for you today? I have introductions on the needles, no off the needles, uh, finished items, uh, I have a giveaway of sewing, of Shackleton acquisitions and discoveries, and I think that's it. So let's just get right to it and go into the knitting before we get into the sewing. So I have on the needles a sweater and a hat. Both are color work and I have been practicing a new technique. I'm a thrower, so I carry my yarn in my right hand and I throw it over the, the right needle. <clears throat> and for the past, I don't know, what am I, I'm 40 now, so 20 years, I have been doing all my color work in my right hand and using two fingers to do that. And it's always felt a little awkward and I've always felt a little bit inefficient. I don't know why it took me this long to attempt to use my left hand to hold a strand and my right hand to hold a strand. I think part of it was I was worried about that it would change my gauge and I didn't want to have to deal with that calculation. Um, and so, well, let's just talk a little bit about it with using an example. So on the needles, I have Kate Davies' Miss Rachel. It is a yoke sweater knit from the bottom up. Big fan of yoke um, and seamless knitting. And I'm not really daunted by the possibility of people talking about drape. This is um, a seamless sweater. It's knit, I believe it's knit from the top down. Seems to be holding beautifully and managing my shoulders just fine. Um, and I don't really have other yoke sweaters that I've knit that have weird drape or pulling when you take them off. They don't look pulled down per se. So I've had lots of um, good luck and maybe that's with the because of the yarns that I choose tend to have a lot of structure to them. The more that you understand about your yarn structure, the more you can play with the, the design and how you um, apply that to your knitting and garments. <clears throat> so anyway, this is Kate Davies Miss Rachel. It's knit with her buccal yarn, which is a sport. It's a two ply. And as you can see, it is a color work. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm, I was worried about my floats and my ability to manage these, the changes of color. Um, sometimes if you aren't paying attention to 
the tension of each of your yarns, you can get puckering, and so you get like a drawing in of the of the color work because you've knit it tighter than it should be. You haven't allowed for ease. But I haven't seemed to run into that problem. But I've been exceptionally conscientious, and I've I don't um, I don't change my needles when I move from straight stockinette to the color work. I didn't go up a needle size or down for this particular sweater. For most sweaters. Um, as a thrower, I typically go up a needle size, so I'm knitting this on a US 4, and I'm knitting the color work on a US 4. But I have tried to pay attention and hold my stitches in such a way that it is allowing for that extra ease in the back. So I think it just needs a bit of a block to kind of let everybody relax. And because at first when I looked at this, I thought it was it was getting a bit of a wave, but I think that's just um, has to do with being on the cable, um, on the circular needles, and um, um, and just being, you know, off the um, off the skein, etc. So I think once it gets wet and gets a nice relaxed block, then it should be fine. So anyway, that's Kate Davies yokes. I have like two more Kate Davies lined up um, in my queue after the sweater is off the needles. So that's been really good practice for me. I've knit the whole thing um, with one color in my left and one color in my right, and um, and I have found that it is more comfortable once I get used to it and more efficient. And I haven't had a bunch of tangling of my yarns, and I don't have to stop as much, and so I've increased my completion speed, I think. <laughs> the other project I'm working on, which is another practice project, uh, for knitting with two colors is the Croft Who's Hat by Ella Gordon. This is the signature design for Shetland Wool Week. I'm knitting it out of Nash Island Tide, Star Croft Tide, I should say. Um, and these are the Nash Island fleeces. This is a great example of a place based yarn, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're kind of wild sheep raised off the coast. They're milled. Um, the fleeces. Uh, for most of Janie's yarns are milled just up the road, and if not, then she does do some um, outsourced yarn that goes to Green Mountain Spinnery. So it's all within a relatively close proximity to Maine, and I think kind of captures the spirit of the community um, in the New England portion of the United States. Ah, my acquisitions are taking over. So, so here it is. This is the. Croft House Hoose Hat and Janie's Tide yarn. She helped me do the coloring for this. Um, oops, sorry, everybody. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of trying to capture all the light that I can. I'm back, <laughs> um, which makes for some small kind of wedged into a corner here. I have not yet knit the Bible hat, which was last year's signature by, um, I think it's Donna Smith. Um, I do have it lined up, um, but I wanted to practice my color work. So I have uh, one more row of hooses to go and then my decreases. So I don't know if you can hear the ducks out there, but they are calling for seed or they're fighting with the squirrels <laughs> so that's it for on the needles I'll talk about my Shackleton project in the Shackleton portion of the show and because those are on the needles too but it seems to be more related to that particular topic right let's talk about finished items they're all sewing so, sewing so. I have knit, I have knit, I've sewn the Esme top before, um, and I've knit another one. I have like three more lined up. They're, these are great shirts. They're great work shirts. Um, I think they make great paddling shirts, um, you know, for paddling and canoeing. Um, I like that they give lots of coverage. They're cotton. Um, I know, I know, cotton kills in the outdoors. Um, 
we can mitigate that problem much easier <laughs> um, when we have lots of wool in our bags. But this is the SMA top. I did do quite a few modifications to this. I shortened it and I also took it in quite a bit. So I, knit, I cut out the 12 based on my um, bust size and my shoulder size, but I feathered it down with, with the seam um, quite a bit. Um, it's just got a lot of extra bulk here in the skirt, this area. And I just didn't like the way that sat, especially with this quilting cotton. It was kind of just really stiff. It didn't have a lot of drape to it. So it kind of ballooned out a little bit. So I just feathered in. I kept everything the same up to the armpit. And then I feathered um, in here. Um, instead of doing that on my actual pattern, I just opted to do it here. I had more control over whether I wanted an inch and a half. Um, I t that's actually what I ended up taking out on each side, an inch and a half on each side, plus the seam allowance, which was five eighths. Uh, so I opted to do that physically with the seams versus with the pattern. I did with the pattern shorten it though, because it was quite long. And, um, and I like just a little bit less length. Um, so just makes it look smart um, for me. I also um, extended the cuffs by an inch on each one. So it had more ease over my bicep and instead of getting caught and kind of poofing over, um, it just tends to move a lot easier, which makes working in these shirts a lot easier. Um, so yeah, I was really pleased with the way this turned out. Now my other one, <laughs> which I'll talk about um, and sewing, which will probably be next since we're on the topic, uh, did not go as well. I have been playing with my serger, and I've had lots of luck serging my edges right here, which is basically overlocking. So you're just making sure that that fabric doesn't have an opportunity to fray, right? So when we finish our seams and sewing, um, we have to um, try to make it so that they don't, they don't fray. And these are just, I just zigzag and then trim because the serger kind of frightens me. It's like a Mack truck. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about that experience with my other uh, work in progress. So I also completed the Endless Summer Tunic. This is a verb for keeping warm pattern. It is designed for wovens. And I, I made it with a knit. Now, I saw this dress on Leah at Clementine. She's the owner of the uh, apparel fabric shop in Rockland. I've talked about her before. Um, and I decided that I wanted to make that. I know. <laughs> I want that dress and that material that you're wearing. So the, the wonderful thing about Clementine is that I get a lot of technical support, whether I'm in the shop or I'm at home. And so we talked about making this dress in a knit, some of the amendments, some of the things to think about. But when I got ready to do it, I actually called Leah and she spent almost, I don't know, 30 minutes talking to the phone with, uh, um, talking on the phone with me about what to do. So it's been great to get that type of technical sewing support. As I mentioned before, it's a little barren up here. Um, so I typically am a bit of a loner, um, on some of these and really have to use technology to, to get support and, um, interactions on these topics. So Leah and I talked about <clears throat> this pattern. It's cut, you can, it's four pieces, one, two, three, four. I didn't want to disrupt the pattern on the front of the fabric. So I actually cut the front on the fold and I wanted to talk to her about, you know, what did I need to think about when doing that? <clears throat> so here it is. This is the endless summer tunic in the knit. And I did on the back cut two separate pieces. Yeah, you can tell, but it's not, it's not a horrific pattern matching. I don't think it would be up to snuff for Patrick on the sewing bee. But um, I think for the behind, it probably works fine. 
The neckline <clears throat> sits kind of proud when I have it on, so it kind of sits up. And I'm not sure if that has to do with how I bound it and it was it was narrow or you know just the shape of it and uh, I tried to amend for that on the second time. So when I cut it, I actually put it on the fold and then I kind of put it on the fold and then I kind of rotated it back a little bit and cut so that the V is wider, which also means that I made the shoulder bands a little narrower and took out some of these, there's gathering here. So we'll see what happens. Um, Leah did mention that she, on her particular version, she had to um, amend this seam that comes up to the armpit, but this actually sits perfectly flat on me. Um, so, you know, you could technically make that straight and come up. So I was happy with playing with and taking some risks um, with this pattern and it, I think it came out just the way I wanted it to and it's really comfortable and I wear it with a pair of capri leggings and, um, and it's really comfortable. I finished the edges uh, using an Alabama Channon uh, method. So I just took some of the knit fabric and did a feather stitch all around. The, I chose the feather stitch because it is a stretchy stitch and so it needs to have give um, versus any other kind of embroidery stitch that may not have that elasticity and I did that around the neckline and here. I left the bottom just raw. I haven't decided if I'm going to do anything with that but, um, but Alabama Channon does use raw edges and leave raw edges and so I went ahead and did that. But the other thing I liked about working with the knits is I didn't have to necessarily finish my seams, um, which I didn't. I could take another tip out of Alabama Channon's book and fell them and use decorative stitches on the outside, but, um, but I didn't feel like I needed to do that with the decorative work on the bound off edges. The other dress that's almost complete is the cinema dress. And this is a Liesel and Company. I did quite a bit of modification to this. Um, oh, before I go on, I just wanted to say that uh, I only had to buy a yard and three quarters um, of that fabric to do that endless summer tunic. So it's a, it's a really great pattern to um, use knits and because you don't really need that much. And again, it's lightweight and comfortable. Um, and... And that was, yeah, that was a 45 inch, it may have been a 50 inch wide fabric off the bolt, but I went with what was recommended for 45. And I made the 37, um, which was the smallest size. Um, and that's um, coordinating to the bust size. So on the Liesel and Company, I made the 10. I moved the waistline up to a more on pure waist. I made that up on how I did it. I basically took the pattern off of, oh, hold on, somebody's at my door. I'm back. Um, so I was talking about the cinema dress and how I made the amendments to the waistband. And basically, um, the one thing I was worried about is this has princess seams here on each side. I didn't want to disrupt any of that. <clears throat> so I basically just extended the skirt up by two inches and cut off the yoke by two inches and elevated it. And these are half inch seam allowances. So I did amend for that in the dress. And I really like where this sits. So everything here and up fits perfectly. I like the way it fits. And it has a button closure in the back here. I messed up my buttonholes, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'll still wear it. There's buttonholes on both sides. <laughs> and what I didn't like is there's a ton of fullness in the skirt. And it makes it, it makes me look a little bit like a bell. And I would like to reduce the amount of bulk in the, in the skirt portion here. So again, I took a, a, a 
note out of Leah's book and I opted to take the skirt um, for my next project and I have overlaid the pattern on the fold by a half inch so reducing the overall skirt in the front and the back by an inch so I've reduced this piece by an inch I'll still get gathers here um, but I'm hoping that the reduction all the way down on the skirt will pull these princess seams in because um, I couldn't figure out another way to reduce I think it's 10 o'clock to reduce um, the sizing I tried feathering in um, the side seams and that just made it look weird so I'm hoping that that will help reduce some of the the bulk of the dress by taking two inches overall out of fabric so speaking of that I am working on another project I am making a shirt version of the cinema dress so I and I um, the other amendment I made to that is I shortened it quite a bit. It just so looks this is going to be the yoke. Me. And again, I've kept the same modifications. Of course, I've shortened it quite a bit. And then this is going to be all the other fabric, the skirt and the side seams, the sleeves, and then I'm going to do contrasting cuffs on the sleeves in the yoke fabric. So and that's going to be probably just about hip length. Um, my sewing machine is not happy making buttonholes in this fabric as I learned, unfortunately, on the first one. So I think, tell me if this is um, kind of a cop out, but I think I'm gonna sew buttons on with snaps. Um, I've never handmade buttonholes. I don't wanna do that on a finished piece. I might do it on a muslin. Uh, but I think that might be an easy way to amend my problem. And I just think the sewing machine doesn't like the ruggedness of this particular fabric. I have no idea, but I can't get it to capture the look that I would like. So that is how I'm going to overcome that obstacle. All right, I have lots of other projects cut out. I have been trying to cut out everything that I want to sew in all my fabrics so that when I commuting, coming home here and there, as just things are ready to go and I can just sew. I don't have to reset up all my patterns and trace and all of that. So I've cut out quite a few things. The other thing I did was I made another SMA top. This is going to be a tank top now. It's me and my serger had a moment. You can see some of the carnage <laughs> here and just I don't know if you can tell but the way that this has been cut is kind of ragged I think what I'm gonna do is just take a uh, binding a piece of um, bias tape and bind the edge I'm hoping this will work um, the blade kind of went hatchet on me and it just like you know Lizzie Bordened my outfit here. I have a hard time controlling the speed and I talked to Leah about it and she said that like a Mack truck when you're using the serger you have to anticipate your turns and your curves and um, much in advance of when you would on your sewing machine. So that is kind of the metaphor, is that a metaphor? That I'm trying to use when I am using my serger. So we'll see. I think Janny my Jedi sewing friend is going to give me a lesson on surging when I go see her next week. So that is sewing and on the needles. And I think what I'm going to do now is quickly take a break and grab my Shackleton items. So up next we have a giveaway, acquisitions and discoveries, Shackleton, and introductions and a quick shout out. So I'll be right back. Okay, let's go right to the Wooly Thistle giveaway. Claire of New Hampshire Knits has opened her shop. She had originally been on Etsy, and now she has her own website, which I believe is thewoollythistle.com. It will be linked in the show notes. She is specializing in importing uh, 
yarns and right now primarily focusing on British yarns. Her tagline is let me take care of the international shipping for you, which is one of my favorite lines ever. Um, I want to work with a lot of um, international yarns. I can't, it's really hard to get my hands on. Uh, as a single person paying all the shipping, I think if you could go in as a group, etc. So I'm going to let Claire take care of that for me. Currently, I know she's working with Blacker, uh, West Yorkshire Spinners, and I just heard rumor on her latest podcast that she'll be working with John Arbon and Eden Cottage Yarns. So, wow, how great is it to have um, access and opportunity to work with some of these people, um, their yarns and their dyeing. So I drew for the Tamar. She generously donated a skein of Tamar, which is tucked away in a plastic bucket upstairs, so it doesn't get any dog hair on it. And the winner for that was drawn from the numbers 2 through 28 by Random Number Generator, and it was number 20, which is Bella Socks, which I know you. Bella Socks has been an active post um, hashtagger for the Soulful Stash hashtag. And I'm going to digress for a moment here. If you are interested in sharing your Soulful Stash, um, which is kind of defined by yarns and fiber that come with a story um, that really capture place and farms and people and the good work um, therein, then feel free to hashtag that Soulful Stash. I really enjoy seeing what everybody's working on, and I think it's a great way to catalog so other people can find yarns and fibers to work with if they're looking for specific breeds or specific local areas that they want to um, explore. Um, the other hashtags that I use, and you're welcome to participate in, is Knit Your Adventure. So I also use this uh, for kind of yarns that take me to new places. Um, Nash Island, for example, I always tag Knit Your Adventure because I can kind of imagine the coast and, you know, breaking surf and waves and, you know, gulls and, you know, all sorts of great wildlife in nature. Um, but also... Um, other yarns that take me to the blacker would be a perfect place for knit your adventure because I feel like that would be a great trek um, and reminds me of the great hill walking I did in Wales and my time in Orkney and so feel free to share with us where your yarn and fiber is taking you and the other one I just started to use is hashtag place based yarns and that kind of coincides with soulful stash but this is another way to give people um, interesting yarns and fibers that are um, exemplifying their landscape and their place. So anyway, um, so Bella Socks, hashtag Soulful Stash, more Soulful Stash coming to you. Uh, get in touch with me so I can get your address and I will send it along. Thank you so much, Claire, uh, for sponsoring this giveaway on the podcast and thanks for keeping up the great work and helping us access really fun and interesting yarns and fibers. Speaking of Soulful Stash and acquisitions, and oh, speaking of Soulful Stash, we're going to go to Acquisitions and Discoveries, I think. Yes. So I received in the mail from a friend and a viewer and a retreat attendee, um, met Sue Just a Little Gray at the New Hampshire Sheep and Wool Festival last year, and she and attended my first uh, Bold Coast retreat, which we're doing again this year, and she is attending. She sent me... Um, some magical yarn that she had spun up at the Hampton Fiber Mill in Vermont. So uh, Sue is not a spinner, but she wanted to participate um, in the process. And so she selected two fleeces last year from Flat Island. So this is Flat Island Clip 2015 and had them spun at the, at the mill. And what an adventure I'm sure that was. So this is it. It is stunning and it captures everything that I love about yarn. Um, gorgeous color, gorgeous luster, uh, and smells pretty darn good too. So Sue sent me enough to do a sweater's worth and I was thinking about um, this particular sweater. Now Sue and I have an uncanny um, connection. We knit a lot of the same sweaters and oftentimes we knit them in gray. So when I got this I had been thinking about the Cerie sweater 
which is this sweater right here. And I had been thinking I had bought, a, um, continued to buy, continued to buy, uh, I had acquisitioned more fiber from the Gray Sheep, which is Gotland Gray, um, a main Gotland flock, to do a sweater. And I was thinking I would do Suri out of it. it. This was knit in Gotland, but I couldn't quite make the gauge match. I didn't think. I wasn't sure. So I was thinking about it. I was doing some math. And at the end of the day, Sue sent this, and I think this is going to work perfect um, for the Suri. Is that coming out for you? So this is a cardigan. It has some really neat um, texture going on in the yoke. And of course I let Sue know this and Sue said, ah, that's what I was thinking. So this is a really gorgeous um, sweater. It's knit in a number of different yarns on here. Um, people have done it in some, here's a great piece of the relief that I'm talking about. Um, so from um, Sweden and from Finland. <clears throat> so go ahead and take a look at this. It's Suri by Lena Oman, and I think that's what this is going to be. Oh, it smells so good. Let me share a little bit with you about what Michael of Hampton Fiber Mill had to say about these fleeces. Um... Michael says to Sue, I think you will like the yarn. It is a dark gray with a lot of depth from the many different shades of fiber in the fleece. I think the color is the most special aspect of this wool. I had a question for you. Were the fleeces rinsed in something prior to coming to the mill? There is a slight floral smell to the wool that survives scouring, picking, carding, pin drafting, spinning, plying, skeining, and skein washing. Is it possible it comes from some anti-moth storage sachet or something of that nature as well? Just curious. The scouring yield was higher than I expected, which also made me think it was pre-rinsed. Um, the scouring yield he's talking about is um, raw fleece. When you scour it, it loses weight, um, sometimes up to a third, and that's just the lanolin, the swint, the veg matter goes away. So this had a high scouring yield, which means there probably wasn't as much, which means you end up with more yarn. And as he says, from these two fleeces, which was about 11 pounds of fleece, got nine pounds of yarn. That's a lot of yarn. So um, Michael's right about this very distinct smell. Um, these fleeces are just stunning. I've said it before. I've said it a million times on here. You know I'm a big Flat Island, Nash Island fan. Um, I just love everything about Every single thing about this fiber I love. And, um, but they're not pre-rinsed and they're not stored anywhere but in sheets and wool sacks. And so, um, so it's just great to hear other feedback from I me. Mean, Michael sees a lot of fleece. Um, these 2016 fleeces will be up for sale very soon. Janie's working on skirting them now. I will have them for sale at the Title Tours Retreat. You can certainly contact me and you can certainly contact Janie of Starcroft directly on her website and her blog and she's also on Instagram if you have any interest in working some with something very different. Knit your adventure, spin your adventure, soulful stash, place-based yarns. Yum. So, um, and there's varying grays. Um, that she has from the light to the dark. I've picked mine out this year. It's different from the one that I got last year. I need to do some spinning on that. I know. So I'm hoping to get um, that wheel organized so I can take it to the retreat and finish spinning my three-ply for my sweater, and then I'm going to do a, a worsted two-ply with the rest so that I'm ready for this next fleece that's coming in. So thank you so much, Sue. It's really just, again, just a magical... Um, a magical gift. The other thing I didn't mention last time on the Gale Force Dash Warning, believe it or not, I mean, how could I not have mentioned this, right? There's so much stash. Was at the New Hampshire Sheep and Wool Festival, I picked up three ounces of Contented Butterfly Shetland. I did it last year, I did it again. Um, and these colors, they're not really showing up. The light isn't as great as I would like it to be. 
Um, this is Darius and Brooklyn and Espiorn. And let's see, I don't know if she put the color on here. This is a Morit. This is black, roving Shetland from Brooklyn. So this is third sheer. This is good information. I didn't look at the tags. This is Darius, who's an adult, and this is an Emskit. And this is the second sheer, third sheer, and third sheer. So, four. I'm sorry. These are these are four ounces each. The other thing that Jen sent me, and Jen unfortunately wasn't able to attend, but her husband was there, um, was she sent me some thin. Because I had wanted to, that was the one fiber I was looking for when I was at New Hampshire Sheep and Wool. And so she sent me some from their farm to try, and it's just awesome, and I'm really excited. This is not what I expected thin to feel like. I'll report more on my experience with that when I spin it. Um, I've got some Cormo on my sidekick, my shock sidekick. I want to finish that up and then I'm going to throw this on. And um, this reminds me a little bit of Gulf Coast Native, actually. It's very poofy and feels very plush versus the long wools that I'm used to. That's why I, I really like working with Shetland. Um, it's got that plushness and um, and um, sponginess that I enjoy. Um, and it, it, you know, I just, a long, I'm a long wool girl, so, um, but the Shetland provides a little bit of a different spinning and gives me an opportunity to do some more lofty yarns, some more woolen spun yarns where the fibers are, um, not all aligned and in perfect harmony. So anyway, um, I wanted to mention that, um, that generous opportunity that Jen afforded me. And also if you're looking for Shetland, um, this is from Vermont and... So, so my other discoveries that I wanted to share with you are a couple podcasts that I've been really enjoying. I feel like they offer, both of them offer really enriching content um, and inspiration. And I very much appreciate the work that they put in to their podcasts. That is the Free Knitting Podcast. They are an Australian couple and they broadcast from Germany and sometimes when they're on vacation and Eva of the Charm of It podcast. So thank you for bringing great content into this Northern Maine home. And if you have more room in your podcast repertoire, I would recommend checking them out if you haven't already. The other one I've been watching, I've just watched one, uh, one episode is, um, let me just double check the name here is, Give Me a Crown, and she's out of New South Wales, Australia, and I just happened to chance upon her in the recommended feeds, and I really enjoyed her podcast. She's really wearing a gorgeous yoke sweater, which is kind of what attracted me to her. Uh, I was like, oh, that kind of looks like something I would knit. Um, so you might want to give her a try as well, and it's great to have uh, a little international flair there, huh? Australia and Germany, and um, just to see what people are doing in different areas and landscapes of the world. All right, let's go to Shackleton. So my Shackleton project, I have cast it on. I know, get out. My Shackleton project, for those of you who are just joining me, um, the Shackleton make along, craft along, do along is really about something you want to do that's epic in your crafting. And we chose, or I chose Shackleton as our inspiration because he led an Antarctic expedition that went awry and was lost for years, but managed to bring home his entire crew alive, which is an unbelievable feat to me. Shackleton has been a big part of my psyche the past year because um, my words were kind of courage and um, I felt like in that moment of my own um, kind of adventure and epic 
commuting in the northern Maine turnpike <laughs> in the dark in the winter was, um, I thought he was a really nice uh, muse for me. So I interpreted that into knitting and went through a series of project designs. I knew that I wanted it to focus on Frost at Midnight by Kate Davies. So this is a lace weight sweater with a beaded yoke and I could not find a yarn that would work. Um, I didn't like the, um, I don't know, I don't know what it was. I just couldn't find what I was looking for in my swatches with um, the recommendation, which is a 50-50 lace, a 50-50 silk wool. So this, again, is a beaded yoke, and knit from the bottom up. I think you need like 2,000 beads. I can't even remember. So these were like unfathomable numbers, right? This is like anarchic expeditioning for me. 2,000 beads, lace weight yarn, knit on US 2s. So in, well, let's just like, you know, put the icing on the cake now, which is, couldn't find the right yarn, so what does my friend Janny suggest? She suggests that I design my own yarn out of some gray fleeces from 2015 from flat, maybe 2014, in the mill. So we did that. I went to the mill. We're designing a Shackleton base. There will be yarn for release. I'll keep you posted on that. I'm hoping for late summer we'll be able to get in back into the mill and work on that. But this is the base. It is... 95% flat island main fleece and 5% silk. Look at that. Come on, people. Um, my friend Jody of Maine Yarn and Fiber Supply and the woman that I um, partner with in my retreats has a hashtag called Gray Wool Woman, which I've started to use. So thanks, Jody. That's a great hashtag. I mean, it seems to suit today. And... I was, I've had this yarn for a while and I've been hanging out on the ice as we like to say in our chatting thread, right? Where you're not really doing anything. You're just kind of like, oh, I'm on the ice or below deck or hull, you know, hulled up, not hold up, hulled up. Um, but I did it. I got it out and I did a th 288 stitch provisional cast on and I knit my first row. So I don't know how exciting that will be for you. I'm going to take this with me on the Tidal Tours retreat, so this will be easy because it is straight on till morning after you do the Pico Edge. I know. Straight on till morning, stockinette stitch. There's no shaping, and I'm thinking I might do some shaping and take some stitches out because I've been reading that for some people the yoke is too wide on their shoulders, and I am doing, I am doing this with positive ease. Kate has three recommendations, a negative ease, a zero ease and a positive ease. So that means that positive ease means there's more fabric. Negative means means there's less fabric. So this is a little bit of a negative ease on me. It kind of hugs my body. So I'm going to do kind of a zero ease, um, but I'm wondering if that might make it harder on, um, I, I think that will make it easier on my, on my shoulders, my broader shoulders, so that hopefully that will hold that yoke. Anyway, we'll see what happens. There it is, Shackleton on the go. So speaking of Shackleton, there's been a lot of great chatter. If you are interested in seeing what people are working on, I'd highly recommend going over there and looking at the pictures. There's some amazing spinning, people fiber prepping, you know, epic yoga jacket knitting, um, but there's just some gorgeous, gorgeous um, fiber and some really thoughtful work going on over there. We also have some finished objects and I haven't drawn for those yet, but I know there will be a drawing at some point. And what I typically do is I draw in the chatter group for a morale boost. And this particular drawing, I went from 1000 to 1068. I drew the name Kleinwitz. I believe she has completed one Shackleton. She may be working on another. So Kleinwitz, go ahead and get in touch with me. Your gift, um, your morale boost is from Maureen of the Victorian Studio podcast for a 
pattern up, worth up to 10 US dollars. So Kleinwitz, keep up the good work. I'm hoping this boosts your morale. Uh, we'll do another drawing. I have a donation from Isabolt, and I had, again, a really generous donation from Shop Teasel for a $25 gift certificate. So we'll find a way to work that in. All right. But let's talk a little bit about what's happening with Shackleton, shall we? Not everybody loves this part, but I like, I like to tout the work that Shackleton did. Um, I like the stories. These are brief quotes that kind of come out of it um, and what's happening. Um, so let me get to the website. I had planned to um, podcast yesterday, but my internet wasn't working that well. And so it made it difficult for me to pull some of this stuff up. All right, well, let me try this one more time. Do you mind a little bit of silence? You know how I feel about silence. Sometimes it's a good thing. You can just sip your tea and, or your coffee and get a few rows in without listening to me drag on. But I should have done this before, I know. Let's see if I can find him, here he is. So we, I had originally thought that they lost the endurance in May, but they don't lose the endurance until October. So I got really confused about when we started the expedition, if it had been a year or two years, if we'd, I was like, I don't even remember. So I had to go back and look at the board. I was like, what? So this is what um, Shackleton has to say about this basic time, which is June, July. So... On June 15th, Frank Wilde, second in command, started his favorite team of dogs, a four to six to four favorite, and the first ever Antarctic Derby. With five teams competing, Wilde's team pulling 910 pounds, or 130 pounds per dog, covered the 700 yard race with a winning time of two minutes and 16 seconds. All 28 men had a bet and winnings were paid in chocolate and cigarettes. So spirits are still high. The men at this point are residing in the endurance. It's locked in the ice. That's kind of where we left off previously, I think in May. And they call it the Ritz. That's what they call their home here on the ice. Beautiful sunrise glows on the horizon came early in July. At midnight on the 11th, the temperature was negative 23 degrees Fahrenheit. The most severe blizzard experienced to date in the Weddell Sea swept down upon them on the evening of the 13th. By morning, the kennels to the windward side of the ship were buried under five feet of snow. By evening, the wind reached 70 miles per hour and the ship trembled under the attack. At least 100 tons of snow piled up against the bow and port sides. Pressure from the ice increasingly became a cause for concern. Distant rumblings and the appearance of formidable ice ridges gradually approached the ship. Shackleton wrote, quote, the ice is rafting up to a height of 10 or 15 feet in places. The opposing flows are moving against one another at the rate of about 200 yards per hour. The noise resembles the roar of heavy distant surf. Standing on the stirring ice, one can imagine it is disturbed by the breathing and tossing of a mighty giant below. End quote. So this kind of overview of um, Shackleton's work is on the website southpole.com. They do a number of Antarctic explorers, and um, this happens to just be the sum of the summary, some of the summary that they um, include for his um, trans-Antarctic expedition. So anyway, ooh, I would love to experience that. I mean, I get a little bit of that here on the ice. If you go out at night, you can really hear that booming, um, especially with um, freezing and thawing. Um, we do get pressure ridges, but I have my number one dream is to go to Antarctica and experience ice like that. It's really inspiring to me. So that's Shackleton. We did a morale project, we did a morale boost. We know what he's doing and I have started my project. Oh, I hear the airplane taking off. 
So, let me take a look at my agenda. Introductions, on and off. Oh, introductions, very quickly. Um, I had three people introduce themselves in the group and I wanted to give them a warm welcome. I also wanted to give a shout out to a dear friend who tunes into the podcast. So I have Tricothon, Tricothon? I think that's how you say it. She's from Canada. She loves rustic and natural yarns. Um, she's starting to sew and she is a spinner and does a bit of weaving. So welcome. Thank you so much for introducing yourself in the group. Lulu Gal is a city girl dreaming of her own sheep. Um, she is doing some designing and those patterns are for sale on Ravelry. So I'd like to welcome you, Lulu Gal. And Lucilla, who has a funny connection, not a funny connection, just a great connection with um, Jody of Maine Yarn and Fiber Supply. And um, she's from Colorado. She works on a heritage sheep ranch, which is Anna Roon's sheep company. She sews, quilts, knits, and spins, and loves raw fleece. And um, would love to uh, connect out here in Maine. It was so wonderful to hear that Jody had a chance to visit with you out in Colorado. And um, she also has a Shepherdess Shield. So stay tuned, uh, I think it's Jen, because this year, um, Heather did a matching uh, shield bracelet for us with um, leather on either side and just kind of a, um, a pressed, a hand spun pressed piece in the middle. So stay tuned for that. And finally, a warm welcome and shout out to my dear friend Catherine from Prince Edward Island. Congratulations on completing your fellowship year and you very much deserve a little sleep in time, some ukulele time and some knitting time all to yourself. And I can't wait to get up there across the border to visit you. So. Did I say so a lot? I think I did. Um, I have a great tagline that gets me out of this podcast provided by IROC Knits. I can never quite remember it, but I know that it's wherever your travels or adventure might take you, that you return home safe and with lots of yarn and fiber. I'll see you next time. Bye.